Hello class. Today, we will be talking about the following key points. Overview of analytical chemistry and the analytical process. Under the overview of analytical chemistry, we shall be expounding more on the brief history and the development of anachem and the branches of analytical chemistry. On the analytical process, we are talking about both the conventional methods and instrumental methods that are being utilized in analytical chemistry. Basically, analytical chemistry is concerned about the two things. Understanding the chemical composition of all matter and developing the tools to elucidate such compositions. It answers the following questions. First, what chemicals are present? Second, what are the characteristics of those chemicals? And third, in what quantities are those chemical, chemicals present? It is not concerned about anything else. It only stops when it already answers those questions. It is up to the scientist to interpret the data that analytical chemistry obtains and up to the government to utilize those data and implement policies in accordance to those data. Just a brief history of the analytical chemistry. There are two major historical points in the development of analytical chemistry. First, early chemistry in 1661 to 1900 AD, which is more about elemental analysis. And second, the further development of instrumental analysis that came after 1900. Take note that in 1600s, scientists all over the world are still more interested in filling up the periodic table and discovering more elements. The big names Justus Leibig, Robert Bonson, and Gustav Kirchhoff were instrumental in this era, especially in the development of the first instrumental analysis. After 1900, major advances in instrumental analysis that led to the progress of separation science which focus more on chromatography and its applications have been translated to the, to the development of more advanced equipment that can now study biological samples. If before analytical chemistry is only concerned about detecting elements, now analytical chemistry can analyze proteins, nucleic acids, and more biological systems. Let's talk about the analytical process first. Analytical chemistry, no matter how advanced it can get, still follows the analytical process. The steps of the analytical process include sampling, sample preparation, separation, and measurement. Even the modern analysis of blood samples follow the analytical process. Extraction of blood from a person is sampling, proper storage and handling of the blood is sample preparation, separating other components that might interfere with the analysis is separation, and using the machine to check the specific component of the blood falls under measurement. Let's have more examples. In analytical chemistry, we refer to the chemical we want to measure as the analyte. analyte. Suppose we want to measure the amount of calcium ions in a river. The first thing that we have to do is sampling. We take representative samples of water from the river. Next, we prepare the sample to make the analyte accessible for measurement. Take note that calcium ions are dissolved in water sample and cannot be measured directly. So what we need to do is to precipitate the calcium ions using an oxalate salt. To precipitate means to make the soluble substance turn into an insoluble substance. By adding sodium oxalate, we form calcium oxalate crystals or precipitate. 
In the photo shown, after the addition of oxalate, white solids of calcium are now formed. Since we now have a solid and liquid component in our matrix, we can now separate them through filtration. Only the solid component remains while the interferences in the liquid matrix are discarded. Take note that calcium is found in the solid substance as the precipitate. After filtration and drying, we can now subject the solid substance to measurement by taking its mass. The mass of the solid substance corresponds to the amount of calcium ions in your water sample, and this can be done by stoichiometric calculations or mole to mole calculation. Branches of analytical chemistry. Basically, there are only two main branches of analytical chem, the traditional and the modern analytical chemistry. In the traditional analytical chem, the bottom line here is scientists manually work in the lab with minimal use of instruments to perform analysis. Modern analytical chem, on the other hand, extensively makes use of modern equipment to perform the analysis. Most of the analysis that are being performed by the medical technologists while utilizing medical equipment in the hospital fall under modern analytical chemistry. Under the traditional analytical chemistry, we have two sub-branches, the qualitative and the quantitative. The qualitative is more concerned about the question, what is present? While the quantitative is more concerned about the question, how much is present? Under this subcategory, we have both inorganic and organic analysis. The main difference between these two is that qualitative or quantitative inorganic and organic analysis are concerned with different analytes. Do you remember what an analyte is? By the way, inorganic analytes are elements or compounds that do not contain carbon, while organic analytes are compounds containing carbon and its functional groups. When you get to study organic chemistry, you will learn that organic compounds are classified to different functional groups. Under traditional analytical techniques, we are discussing about four examples. Volumetric analysis, gravimetric analysis, potentiometric analysis, and inorganic qualitative analysis. Volumetric analysis, as the name suggests, uses volumetric titration. Volumetric titration is more particular about how much volume of a known substance reacts with a specified volume of a substance with unknown concentration to determine the amount of analyte that is present. Once again, let me reiterate, volumetric titration is more particular about how much volume of a known substance called the titrant reacts with a specified volume of a substance with unknown concentration called the titer. So we have both titrant and titer. To determine the amount of analyte that is present here in the titer. Thus, we have three things here not two. First, the volume of substance with known concentration that reacts. Second, the known volume of the substance with unknown concentration. And the third one is the indicator. What does an indicator do? An indicator tells whether or not the reaction has been completed. It tells when the substance of known concentration fully reacts with the substance of unknown concentration, 
by the relative changes in the pH of the solution. Therefore, this method is being widely used in acid-base titration and redox titration. In titration, we have the given setup. We use a burette, this glassware, to dispense the substance of known concentration. And once again, this substance is called a titrant. In the conical flask, we place a specific volume or amount of our analyte of unknown concentration with the indicator. Our analyte is called the titer. This one. By dispensing the titrant, it reacts with the analyte slowly until the reaction is completed. When the reaction is completed, the indicator will start to change the color of the solution. The point when the indicator changes in color is called the end point. The point when the analyte is fully reacted by your titrant is called the equivalence point. There's a difference between end point and equivalence point, and we shall be learning more about it in the midterms. In relation to the same subtopic, we shall learn more about indicators first. Indicators are substances that change in color at definite pH range. For example, in the case of paranitrophenol, this one, when doing the titration, gradually adding a base to an unknown acidic solution containing acid analyte makes its pH rises. So if our analyte is an acid, basically the pH lies in the acidic region, so around here. But if you gradually add the titrant and titrant is a base, generally the pH rises until here until it goes into pH 7. So at pH 7, both the acids and the base are completely reacted. And take note that at this point also, paranitrophenol changes its color from colorless to yellow. It is the indicator that determines when the reaction is completed. The indicator paranitrophenol changes color from colorless to yellow at around pH 7. And when it changes color, you can know when the analyte fully reacts with your titrant. When your reaction exhibits changes at different pH, that is when you use other indicators to catch a glimpse of that change. For example, we have methyl yellow, this one. The changes from red to yellow at around pH 3.1 and brom cresol green this one that changes from yellow to blue at around pH 4.7 in order to get an overview of how titration is made feel free to look at the video provided Titration is a technique used to work out the concentration of an unknown solution when you know the concentration of another solution. You carefully add the known solution to a set volume of the unknown solution until the reaction is complete. This enables you to work out the concentration of the unknown solution. You may need to use the indicator to signal the end of the reaction. You can calculate the concentration of an acid or an alkali by carrying out a titration experiment. In this video, we're going to look at how to carry out titrations. In the next video, we will then look at the calculations to go with the experiment. The apparatus needed for titrations looks like this. The pipette is needed to accurately measure a certain volume of the unknown solution into the flask. The barrette is then used to accurately measure and add the unknown reactant to the unknown until the reaction is complete. The barrette can measure up to 0.05 cubic centimeters accuracy. To carry out the titration, you follow these steps. 1. Using the pipette, 
and a set volume of the unknown solution to a clean conical flask. Two, you may also need to add a few drops of indicator. Three, fill the barrette with a known solution. Four, record the starting volume on the barrette. Five, slowly add the solution from the barrette to the unknown solution in the conical flask. You may need to soil the flask to mix or use a stir plate. 7. Stop adding when the reaction is complete. The end point is reached. This is where an indicator may help because there would be an appropriate color change. 8. Record the final volume. 9. Subtract the final volume from the initial reading. This gives you the volume of the solution added. This volume is called the titra. 10. For an accurate experiment, you should repeat this experiment a few times until you get consistent values for the titra. Depending what indicator you use will depend if the color change is gradual or a sudden change. If you are carrying out an acid alkali titration, you may use a universal indicator which would give you gradual color change, whereas litmus would give you a sudden color change. Sometimes the acid may be the known solution and the alkali unknown, and other times the alkali the known and the acid unknown. So we've carried out the titration a few times and have a consistent titra value. What do we do next? Titration calculations. Now that you know how to carry out titrations, watch the second part of this video to see how to do a titration calculation to work out the actual concentration of the unknown solution. All you really need to remember is that titrations are used to work out the concentration of an unknown solution when you know the concentration of another solution. Another traditional technique that is widely used is gravimetry or gravimetric analysis. The main point of this analysis is the determination of the weight of the sample containing the analyte before and after some transformation meaning the data that we usually obtain from this analysis is masses or weights. The example I have given before, the determination of calcium in a known water sample makes use of weighing, right? That is basically an example of gravimetric analysis. We have calcium ions dissolved in water. We precipitate it using oxalate salts, filter and dry it, and finally, obtain its mass or weight using an analytical balance. Then we can relate the amount of calcium to the mass of the precipitate through simple calculations. We have talked about volumetric analysis which involves determining the volume of the titrant that reacts with your analyte in the presence of an indicator. Gravimetric analysis which takes into account the weight of the analyte before and or after some transformation. And now we are talking about potentiometric analysis. Generally, the setup used in potentiometric analysis is similar to that of volumetric titration. We use a burette. However, the main difference is the use of potentiostat. A potential step measures the changes of voltage potential of the solution upon addition of the titrant to your analyte. The change in the vo voltage potential is being measured and is related to the amount of analyte in your sample. Basically, it relates the concentration of analyte to the difference of the voltage potential it generates. Finally, the last example of traditional analytical technique is inorganic qualitative analysis. Take note that the previous techniques I have discussed so far are quantitative analysis, meaning they aim to measure the amount of analyte in your sample. Now, we are talking about inorganic qualitative analysis. This only seeks to confirm the presence of specific analytes 
typically elements or ions in your sample. For instance, if your water sample contains iron ions, the addition of a certain reagent that changes the color of the solution to red in the presence of iron ions confirms the presence of iron ions in your sample. If no change in color, then there might be no iron ions in your unknown water sample. 